So I think this is enough for um, business rules for now for what we're creating. Um, so now let's start working on our 2B workflow diagrams, right? So let me go. For workflow diagrams, um, the, the software that I'm using is called draw.io. Um, this is typically, uh, if you um, are working as a business analyst, you'll probably be using something called Microsoft Visio, um, which is an enterprise tool for, uh, for uh, practice you guys can use. There's lots of um, web-based or online tools that you can use. Um, draw.io is just one of them. So last week we created our use case diagram. Um, this week we're gonna start our uh, 2B workflow. So typically when we're working or creating 2B workflows, um, there's different levels of workflows that you can create. Level zero is very, very high level. And then you can dive deeper um, and um, I'll show you what that means. I think today we're gonna have time just to do our high level and maybe level one of a particular workflow, but um, there's different levels of workflows that you can do. Typically level zero um, is very, very high level to say, okay, um, to identify uh, the basic um, format of what, what it is that we're trying to build. Level one will be a little bit more extensive. Um, level two will be even more expansive and more detail oriented. So the reason why we have different levels of workflows is to showcase progression of uh, functionality in systems, right? So our high level or level zero workflow would be, um, you know, we're gonna start these oval um, shapes um, identify start and ending points. Our rectangle shows us um, a process or represents a process. And each of these boxes, which represents a process could um, in fact have um, a workflow in itself. So let's say if this box um, says um, assign rooms to, once you completed your high level, you wanna drill down deeper um, into level ones and level twos um, to get the end-to-end -end workflow of your of your work uh, of your processes or your systems that you're building. So for now, let's get started with level zero. So here, um, uh, our end-to-end -end workflow would be um, for admin. Uh, admin. Let me make sure our case study is for supervisor or admin. Actually, let me look at our workflow diagrams or use cases rating staff. So our, it's our supervisor that is assigning staff as well as our manager or admin. So we can say in our um, high level admin, first let's see, let's have them check schedule. And let's just go with assign staff. So once they assign it, they want to uh, uh, check. Uh, we'll put a, a high level decision point to say uh, completed cleaning. This is the staff completing cleaning. Um, and then we want to have a supervisor. Okay. Um, so once they make that room available, that's where the process ends. Okay. This is what our, in um, a nutshell, this is what our, our, our system or our app that we're building will do. This is called level zero workflow, which is which means that it's very, very high level um, and not a lot of detail um, on functionality that we're building in, uh, which it's supposed to be. You're always supposed to start with very, very high level and then build on top of it. So each of the things that you see here, I'm trying to put this in one page, give me one second. Each of the things, each of the boxes you see here, which represent processes, can in fact have their own workflows, right? Um, and we'll, we'll see that um, uh, if not, probably not today, um, next week, we'll dive deep into these workflows. So we'll call this level zero. So now um, at least let's do one uh, deeper. Uh, Sarajit, can you just uh, read the level zero workflow? I'm sorry, what? what? Can you please uh, read the, what is mentioned in the level zero workflow, the steps? I don't understand what you're saying. Can you repeat? Uh, what I'm saying is that would it, be, would it be possible for you to read what is mentioned in the level zero about two? What is the process? High level process. I still don't understand. Can you maybe type it up in the comments area or the chat area? Okay. okay. 
chat um, for for this um, for um, Zoom. So we'll continue doing that. Um, let's try to do level one. Um, so again, level zero is very, very high level. Each of the levels under it are a little bit more detailed. What I always like to do is when we're working on end-to-end -end workflows, um, I like to do um, something called swim lanes. Swim lanes show um, you know, roles of our, our actors. So I would show um, some, what the admin is doing, I would show what the cleaning staff's responsibility is, and I would show the supervisor um, and the um, supervisor and admin in, in three different, because they all have different roles um, within our app, right? So let me set that up for now. And we'll have um, Rahul validate um, what we're doing here uh, makes sense from a industry standpoint, because again, um, don't have industry experience. So when you're writing these case studies, it kind of is like make, land of make-believe. You try to do the best you can with the information that you're given, because again, there's no right or wrong answers in case studies. They, they are just um, to show that you have a logical, um, you're showing a logical progression of requirements, which is taking some very little information that you're given, and you're building a logical approach to how you would build a piece of software or functionality for your stakeholders, okay? That's all it is. So um, end to end, um, at the very high level, let's start building this out. So you're gonna start, um, let's say we're writing this um, workflow from a staff standpoint, right? So our staff will start. And maybe log into the app and they will check for assigned rooms. So let's see how this looks. Again, we'll make adjustments as we need them. So think of uh, the cleaning staff using a mobile app. They log in and they check their schedule for assigned rooms. They start the timer um, when they start cleaning. Um, the question is, are you, is, cleaning done, if the answer is no, and we have to fix this box to make sure that um, it, it makes sense. So we'll fix that in a little bit. So this is no. And then when they end the timer, um, we put another decision point to say uh, completed all. I think then they just um, end shift. So when they end the timer, that should be a trigger to the supervisor to um, go in and inspect the rooms, right? Because that's what a supervisor is doing. They're inspecting rooms to make sure that they've been cleaned properly. So now let's talk about what this person is doing. So when he gets a notification, he or she gets a notification that uh, room is cleaned and it's ready for inspection, what they would do is, and again, I'm making this up, you guys, uh, inspect the room, um, they will rate it, uh, uh, rate the cleaning. You guys, my baby's up. My husband's traveling again, so Mom. give me one second. Yes, baby? Yes, it is. Can I, can I have five minutes? I'll be right there. Okay. All right. So um, we'll try to finish this up in five minutes and then we'll continue this next week wherever we leave off. We may not be able to finish this today, I think, which is okay. Um, if you guys want to um, continue working on this after the session is over and post what you've done in the, when the somebody ends the timer for a particular room, um, we get notification onto the supervisor to inspect the room. They rate it, um, determine if re-cleaning is required, right? And if they, if let's say, um, if it is required, then we would want the ability to um, answer no. I would say um, they rate the cleaning and then mark, um, uh, provide notes and sign off or I don't know if that's the actual term, but for now we'll just say that the uh, supervisor, um, if no cleaning is required, they rate the room and they provide a sign off. 
Uh, now, once they do that, that should um, give a trigger to our admin person um, to do the final inspection, but we won't go into that for this week. Um, so what happens here, um, if they need to reassign it, then it probably goes back to the cleaning staff to check schedule for cleaning purposes. Okay, how do you guys feel? Sounds great till now. Okay, yeah, so what, what this does is it allows you to logically think about how software programs, um, or in our case, this app should flow um, from a business standpoint, right? Uh, for the users and what their role is gonna be in an application. What this does is it allows you to validate with your customers um, to show them mommy, what, mommy, how it should work. Okay, mama coming. And what it does is it gives you um, an opportunity to get um, real feedback that you could use in enhancing your project, right? So typically you're working with stakeholders. Once you diagram these things, you can go back to your stakeholder, get feedback. If you've missed something, you can add it in. What this does is it eliminates a lot of rework. So let's say if we didn't go through this, and even when you do, you sometimes often find that um, stakeholders have missed something. Um, and when you're adding things, um, typically in the waterfall environment um, at a later state, it's very, very expensive. In the agile environment, let's say if we miss a functionality, if it needs to be in the MVP, then um, you would try to um, you know, negotiate timelines and things like that. But typically you can just put it in the next sprint. So it's not such a big deal in agile, but in waterfall, if you've missed requirements, it could get very, very expensive. So for that reason, even if you're working in the agile environment, you would wanna create a high level workflow um, or you know, detailed workflows for what is in the MVP to make sure that you are getting requirements and you're are listing features that need to be included in the minimal viable product um, for our product owner to sign off on. So doing these workflows helps you understand how the logical flow needs to work for our customers, our users, our actors of the systems, as well as it, it helps you to understand um, and work with their developers on what needs to be built. It also helps from a prototyping standpoint. So uh, this is typically what you would do as a business analyst day in and day out. They're gonna start a timer. The decision point is, have they completed the cleaning? If the answer is yes, they're gonna end the timer. When they hit end on the timer, that should give a notification to the supervisor, the supervisor. To, in, to inspect the room. They will then rate the cleaning, determine if free cleaning is needed. If it is, then they will go back and probably assign um, a staff to come back and clean. If no cleaning is required, they provide sign off, they add notes and they provide sign off. That should send a trigger to the admin to do the final inspection, right? Okay. But in the event that um, uh, for staff, we have a few more things. If um, they're not done with their entire cleaning, right? So have you completed all rooms assigned? If the answer is no, they're gonna, we have to fix this box, I'll highlight it. This one uh, we need to fix. So completed all rooms, no. If the answer is no, they're gonna go back and you know start cleaning another room. And if they have um, completed all the rooms that are assigned. Do you guys understand what we just did and how it helps in building um, yeah. your systems a little bit better? And that stakeholder yeah, sure. engagement is so important that you cannot forget that. And that's what I miss from these case studies is because um, we don't have that interaction and that you know, validation that we, we so need as business analysts to deliver better systems and better projects.